So it was 1981, I got to Boston in August. The first papers in the New England Journal were in the middle of that year. Uh, and it was absolutely fascinating because there was a, um, an immunodeficiency disorder of adults which um, seemed really quite, uh, quite extraordinary. Uh, and so that was, you know, I just became involved at, the, at that stage and um, I realised that um, when I came back to Australia it may well be a problem because I went back to my uh, original hospital where I trained at St Vincent's Hospital in Sydney which was a, an inner city, inner city teaching hospital. Uh, and with the geography of Sydney, the hospital is on one side is the, the gay community and on the other side is the sort of King's Cross, sex, drugs, rock and roll, right? And so I thought, well, <laughs> if it's going to be a problem in any hospital in Australia, it would have to be at, at, at my institution and, and that's what happens. That's where we, uh, where we saw the first cases, uh, where we actually saw the seroconversion illness we actually described it and published the seroconversion illness in The Lancet in 1985 when in fact there were very hardly any cases of, of AIDS in Australia at that time so the virus was just being introduced into the, into the gay community in Sydney. But it, it was difficult and you know at, in the peak year which would have been 92-93 uh, would, I would have ha had a ward of about 36 people, um, you know, continuously uh, quite very, very sick and dying and really difficult. And it was a very, very stressful time for me. Um, in the end, I just couldn't even face going to funerals. It was just so horrible. You know. And so I was able to apply my, you know, clinical skills and, and investigation in the laboratory to sort of define that, uh, that, fa that first phase of the infection. And of course that's become now absolutely critical in, in, in cure research because um, that's the time at which maybe the reservoirs are not uh, laid down in, in, in large, large amount and therefore that might be the time to, you know, to intervene and produce a cure as, as for example in the, uh, the Mississippi baby. So in 1994 it was Yokohama. Um, I, I was involved in, in Yokohama in the organisation. Uh, I thought it was important because uh, it was actually in our region. It was the first conference that was in, in Asia Pacific and, you know, being someone that comes from that part of the world, that was important. And, you know, I still think that concentrated epidemics in Asia Pacific are a real, a real challenge. Uh, so I was involved in the meeting and I supported, I supported the meeting, but it was the pits because, you know, the Concord result had come out in Berlin and to generate any enthusiasm uh, one year later was really, uh, was really very, very difficult. What I didn't realise was, was what um, a minimal organisation that it was. It was essentially a site selection committee for the World AIDS conferences. Um, it had a, um, a membership which was pretty um, low and not terribly influential um, and it didn't have much money in the bank. Um, it, was, um, it had about I think $50,000 in a, in a bank account in Hamburg. <laughs> so it wasn't a good base to, uh, to start the International AIDS Society. Um, so, together with Lars Callings, who, um, who became Secretary General at, at Yokohama, we sort of set about trying to, to uh, rather than to, you know, to be a, a big advocacy organisation, just to, to, to try and get the grassroots together, to try and get it as an international organisation that had some roots, to try and get some finance and to you know try and get generate some interest and to also try to say to the international community IES needs to be not just the site selection committee but needs to be the the people who take responsibility for these conferences and that didn't happen immediately um, you know the Canadians had already decided about doing Vancouver um, 
and so it took it took quite a while for you know for that transformation to occur but we did set in place the tools to to allow it to happen so obviously it was a, a huge uh, euphoria at that meeting um, you know I, I, Julio Montana who's you know one of the other past past presidents um, you know had put was spoke about the Inca study which was one of the you know the really important combination therapy studies in this case using a non-nucleoside not a protease inhibitor but that was that was very important and that was a study that Ublanger and Julio and myself had actually designed together you know so that that was that was very exciting and to just see the field sort of transform before your eyes um, was really um, you know great compared to the, um, the, the the, the misery, if you like, of um, of, uh, of Yokohama. So that was um, that was a really, really, very good, uh, very good feeling. The, the provision of, of antiretrovirals um, post Vancouver was was you know was a really big issue. Um, we managed it pretty well in in rich countries, um, you know, who could afford to, to to pay the money, and you know we saw the. The Lazarus effect, right? The, the wards just emptied out, and that was a huge relief. Um, I think we didn't go very rapidly um, from '96 to 2000 to to realise the plight of the uh, of low and middle income countries. For me, I think the, the 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 biggest thing right now is you know how do we optimise the rollout. Um, the uh, the donors are I think plateauing, and we've got more and more people to treat, uh, and we have to work out how to do more with less uh, money, uh, or more with at least the same money. Uh, and for me, that's what's really exciting. How, what are the ways in which we can provide uh, clinical science evidence for doing things? more efficiently, more effectively, more cost effectively. The cure issue is, um, is, is a complex one. I, I, I think the science is really important to, to work on that. I'm not sure that it's ready for you know, putting potentially um, toxic drugs into, into people. Um, and particularly when we have such effective um, antiviral drugs, you know, so uh, I'm and, and, and one of the other things that I think um, suffers in that is, is vaccine research. Um, at the end of the day, I don't think antiretroviral therapy, as good as it is, is sustainable for life of a person. Um, uh, I'm not sure whether we'll eliminate HIV with test and treat. I haven't done that for tuberculosis. We've never done that for syphilis, so I'm not sure. Um, and they're curable diseases, right? Um, so I, I, I think that, you know, we have to be careful that we don't move to the next most exciting thing. And at the end of the day, I think a vaccine is, is the one way that will be a sustainable uh, preventive strategy, that vaccines are the, are the best things to prevent um, infectious diseases. As much as I've been involved in antiretroviral therapy, as fascinating as it's been, as the, the fact that I've um, been involved in every drug that's been <laughs> developed at some level, whether it's phase one or phase three or whatever, um, and each one of those drugs has a, a personality <laughs> of its own, um, as much as I think it's been a modern medical miracle, I think, yes, it'll be a mainstay of of the way we approach the epidemic. I think the treatment as prevention has been a, a big advance to, to protect other people, uh, but I still think that um, a vaccine is, uh, at the end of the day, is the, um, is the way to go, and we mustn't lose that, that momentum, as difficult as that is. Right?